Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Lue Fatui, an author and researcher in Islamic studies and comparative religion. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate your invitation to your excellent and, uh, and unique channel. That's very kind. Thank you. Dr. Fatui was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and migrated to the UK in the 90s. Uh, he has a, a PhD in astronomy from Durham University. He originally came from a Christian family, but reverted to Islam in his early 20s. He has published over 25 books in English and Arabic in Islamic studies and published over 20 research papers in cosmology and applied historical astronomy and on the Islamic calendar. Today, Dr. Fatui has kindly agreed to do a presentation on the question, does the Quran deny the crucifixion of Jesus? And this is a surprisingly controversial question uh, to many people. Um, so, um, Fatui, Dr. Fatui, would you kindly just introduce us to this subject, why it's even a controversial question? Because uh, uh, for many people, perhaps most Muslims, the answer is very clear. But in fact, it's not so clear to another group of people who have uh, queried this um, assumption, whatever that might be. So would you like to introduce us to the subject? Thank you. Absolutely, uh, Paul. Um, the, this particular subject, the crucifixion of Jesus in the Quran, has been a topic of discussion um, between Muslims and non-Muslims for centuries, really. And the reason being, as you know, is that the crucifixion is, that, is at the heart of Christian theology. Uh, redemption, etc., is all based uh, on the concept of the suffering Messiah, of course. Mm. Uh, that is something that supposedly uh, the Quran denies. Most Muslims believe that over the centuries, as we will discuss. Mm. Obviously, by denying that, um, the Quran effectively is undermining a cornerstone of Christian theology. As a result, this subject has always been uh, the, a lively debate between Muslims and non-Muslims. And uh, what I would like to do uh, here is to discuss the history of the interpretation uh, of the Quran on the subject, uh, as well as uh, talk in more detail and kind of present my own view uh, on how to approach and understand this particular subject in the, in the Quran. Excellent. Mm, very good. Um, okay, now uh, I'm going to share uh, my screen here uh, because uh, I think it would help to use uh, a presentation because we're going to go through um, some technical details really that I think the audience would find it more helpful to look at the screen while we talk about. So I'm going to start by giving an overview of what we are going to cover today. Uh, I would like first to clarify I'm not going to speak about the historicity of the crucifixion of Jesus. This is a completely different subject. I know it's, again, at the heart of disagreement between Muslims and non-Muslims, and indeed between Muslims and historians in general, who believe that Jesus was crucified. So, but that isn't actually the subject of um, this particular uh, discussion. It's not to say it's not worth a discussion, but of course, we need to focus here in more detail uh, about the, what the Quran says on that particular issue, whether uh, the crucifixion is historical or not, is, is not the subject uh, today. Uh, I'll be talking about the history and language, the history of the interpretation of what the Quran says and the language of the Quran on the subject. I will only touch very little on theology. Uh, there will be instances where that needs to be mentioned, but I will try to avoid it. Uh, I will talk about the consensus uh, that has survived the centuries that the Quran denies the crucifixion. And I will also then move on to talk about uh, the attempt to reject this consensus. Uh, and I, I'll speak about the motives and methods uh, behind these attempts. 
So the, cons- the consensus is amongst Muslims, obviously, that the Quran denies the crucifixion, and the the rejecting the consensus is some other people, non-Muslims, who mainly who have their own reasons for rejecting that view. I guess. A good question, Paul. Actually, even non-Muslims uh, agree that the Quran denies the crucifixion. So historically, uh, scholars, Muslims, non-Muslims, more or less agreed that this is what the Quran says. However, uh, more recent attempts have been made to show that the Quran actually does not deny the crucifixion. And that involves uh, mainly Christian theologians, but also some Muslim scholars. And I'll, I'll mention some of them. And so to clarify then, so that we're focusing, you're focusing today on this question of what the Quran itself says about the crucifixion. We're not dealing with the issue, was Jesus crucified or not? But just to establish is, what is the Quran saying? Because there have been some Christian scholars who are now claiming that the Quran does not deny the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is kind of the issue you're dealing with today. Is that right? Absolutely, Paul. Spot on. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's what we're dealing with. Good. Um, now, in the course of uh, discussing the consensus and otherwise, uh, we will have to touch on the subject of whether the Quran engages with the Talmud, because this is one of the arguments made in favor of rejecting the consensus um, that survived for a long time. Uh, also, in the course of doing that, and because we're dealing with the language of the Quran, uh, I will also be dealing with exegetical issues uh, that relate to various texts um, that are relevant to the subject of, the cruci- of, of crucifixion. And just to clarify, ex- exegetical text simply means, you know, how we understand, interpret the text, how we understand what the Quran actually says, what its words actually yeah. say, how, how yeah. we read those. That's what exegetical means. Okay, thank you. Yeah, exegesis means to draw something out of something else, so effectively to draw the meaning or to extract the meaning of the text in this particular okay. instance. Okay. And uh, my presentation uh, is obviously building uh, on works of others, but it will also have new insights, some of the um, information I'll present there and readings um, uh, are my own work. So that's an overview of what we're going to cover today. I'll start by first um, just showing the verse that in a question, and I call it the non-crucifixion verse. Uh, most would call it the crucifixion. Probably you know where I'm going with that. Mm. Uh, but um, the, the, at least on the face of it, it denies the crucifixion. Nobody would deny that on the face of it. Um, now, uh, I have highlighted here um, the, the, the kind of text that I have quoted here is a sayings that is attributed to the Jews. So the Jews, the Quran says the Jews have made the claim, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. And then the Quran responds to that by saying, they did not kill him, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ Nor did they crucify him, وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ But it was made to appear so to them. Those who differ, differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following um, conjecture. They did not kill him with, with certainty. So I want just to put it first here so everybody can see it before we're going to deal with it in more detail later on. I want to mention a couple of things about it, though. Uh, this is the only verse that directly deals with the subject of the crucifixion of Jesus. We will be talking about other verses that indirectly linked are linked to the subject of crucifixion but this is the only place where this subject is directly tackled in the quran the other important point that i would like to make um as most of your audience uh, probably know uh, there's a concept of qira'a qira'at in the quran as the skeleton text how the text uh, is is drawn written uh, of the quran there are seven uh, let's call official accepted qira'at readings there are another three that some accept, <clears throat> so 10 in total, and there are another four anomalous readings. So if you want to go accept the whole thing, there are 14 of them. This verse appears identical in all of these verses. Ah, and the reason I mention this, to exclude any suggestion or anybody thinking that 
this there could be some changing in the wording. Yeah, ambiguity. Yeah. Yes, there is no ambiguity. It's the same in all of these uh, readings. So I'm going to start by talking about the mis- Muslim consensus. Hmm. One thing here to highlight is that Muslims over the centuries of all schools of thought agreed that the Quran denies the crucifixion. And they base their interpretation on that particular verse, as well as other references in the Quran. And I have to add other extra Quranic material, hadith and some other stuff. And I mention here the main four, the main two really um, kind of uh, Muslim groups, Sunnis and Shias. And I have mentioned as well uh, some well-known names in those schools of thought. These are well-known exegetes. And I have tried to cover uh, the earliest to very recent ones to show that over the centuries, all of these people, when not exegetes, agreed that the Quran denies the crucifixion. Right. So, Tabari, Mawardi, Qurtubi, etc. To this day, again, Tulsi, Tabrasi, Tabatabai, all of them. The same applies with the smaller uh, schools, Mu'tazili, uh, who are rationalists, and Sufis, who are more kind of um, interested in spiritual side of things. Again, all of these um, agree that the Quran denies the crucifixion. The consensus of Muslims on this issue is really significant, significant in, in various ways. Um, Muslims, Muslim exegetes are no different from scholars of other scriptures. They argued a lot, debated a lot, disagreed a lot. So the fact they have this kind of strange consensus must be taken into account. I'm not somebody who argues that consensus is, is itself an argument because people agreed something is, you know, a lot of them said this is so-and-so, so we have to accept it as, as true. But here it's quite significant because they disagree on just about anything. If you pick up, for instance, Tabari, Tabari is the oldest, earliest meta-exegetical work. So it involves basically the opinions of so many scholars on, on the Quran. And what you find is that uh, for every ayah verse, uh, the Tabari cites a variety of opinions. At times, uh, um, exegetes differ even on single words. So uh, one word in a, in a verse, and you have multiple opinions on that. Uh, and that shows you how lively, lively the debate has been within uh, Islamic scholarship when it comes to the interpretation of the Quran. Yet all of these have agreed that the Quran uh, denies the crucifixion. What's interesting is, as well, uh, the uh, the denial supposedly in the verse one five seven of chapter four. As soon as you move to one five eight, so the verse following the non crucifixion verse, that consensus breaks down. Hmm. So immediately, the different scholars start developing different opinions about what happened exactly when Jesus was spared the crucifixion, what happened to him? And then you have a variety of uh, interpretations. Is that all right, Paul? Any- yeah, no, I, just, I was just going to read, I'm looking at my um, Abd al-Halim translation of that verse, uh, 158, uh, which says, no, God raised him up to himself. God has the power yeah. to deny. So, you know, was it an ascension? Was it what, what was going on there? So that's where you're saying there was a lot of exegetical uh, discussion, uh, whereas the preceding verse, with its denial of the crucifixion, there is no debate. It's clear, you know, and there's a consensus. Absolutely. And I might add also another note here, important note. Most Muslims over the centuries believe that Jesus did not die on earth. He was raised alive to heaven. And there are, you know, stories about what's going to happen afterwards. However, um, a, a new kind of trend among some scholars, they started to develop early in the um, 20th century. Uh, I think the first name that we can, major name we can cite is Muhammad Abdu, the Egyptian reformist, the great Muhammad Abdu. His follower, uh, Rashid Rida, uh, other 
uh, as from the Azhar uh, school of thought, uh, Muhammad Shaltout, uh, Al Ghazali, Muhammad Al Ghazali, uh, Mustafa Al Maragi, uh, others. These people uh, went against the consensus, and they suggested that Jesus actually died on Earth. What's interesting about that is that even this group of scholars who believe that Jesus died on earth still believe he was not crucified. Right. So, and it just shows the strength of opinion in terms of, and, and let's say the clarity of the Quranic text in the eyes of all of these scholars. Okay. Okay. Now, what can we tell, uh, say about non-Muslim consensus. Well, um, I think we can go back as far as uh, Sophronius, uh, the patriarch of Jerusalem, who wrote uh, about, um, you know, three, four, five years after the death uh, of Prophet Muhammad, uh, he was talking about the Saracens, that the Muslims, and he was arguing, why is the cross mocked? Now, what does he by, man, mean by that? Clearly, he meant that the Muslims did not believe in the cross. It had no significance for them. And he considered that some form of mocking. Now, uh, he, by the way, he was, a bit, he was actually in Jerusalem with, when uh, the Caliph Omar went there, met with him. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a bit of story uh, there. But then we have another reference, an earlier reference from uh, John of Damascus. So... Uh, he wrote, let's say, about 100 years after um, the death of the Prophet Muhammad. And I would like to quote from him what he says here. And he says, talking about now he started, the, the, what's leading to this particular paragraph is that uh, he accused the Prophet Muhammad of plagiarizing from the Old Testament and New Testament. Obviously, this is kind of quite a standard argument against the Quran. After saying that, and, and also he attributed uh, that plagiarism uh, to the help of an unnamed monk. So there was somebody who was apparently helping the Prophet Muhammad uh, to come up with the Quran using the Old Testament and New Testament. So he goes on to say, and he says, that's Muhammad, meaning the Quran, that the Jews wanted to crucify him. Now, notice wanted to crucify him mm. in violation of the law. In violation of the law, that isn't actually what the Quran strictly says. So it looks like a bit of interpretation from him and that they seized his shadow. Now, that's very interesting. Again, the Quran does not actually say that, say that because this is a reference to Docetism. Docetism is the um, concept that Jesus was, um, was more kind of, of, of a spirit really than a body. Um, and uh, so a, what was um, seized, if you like, crucified, wasn't really the, his, his, him really. So he appeared, appeared that's um, from the Greek word where Ducetism uh, came from. He appeared like, uh, like he had that body, but he didn't. Uh, in fact, uh, Muslims actually uh, don't accept the uh, concept of Ducetism. And um, so he say, and they seized his shadow and crucified this. But the Christ himself was not crucified, nor did he die. Now, what's interesting here, notice how this matches the double denier, denial in the Quran. They did not kill him, nor they crucify him. As if he had access to the text itself, so he knew exactly what it said. But further than that, he goes on to say, um, for God, out of his love for him, took him to himself into heaven. Again, this is actually what the Quran says about Jesus. Yeah. So what we have here is an early um, Christian theologian who effectively agrees that this is what the Quran said about Jesus. Are we okay there, Paul? Perfect. Any comment? Very helpful. Thank you. Now, I would like to talk about, the, you explained earlier, the concept of exegesis. They, obviously, this is a more kind of popular term, but there's an even more vague term, let's say, which is eisegesis. Um, and I probably better, um, and I'll explain why I'm uh, presenting both ideas. Exegesis is the interpretation of a text. And I'm going to use this graph just to 
kind of show um, more clearly what it means. We as scholars, human beings, if we want to access a piece of text, and in this case, uh, scripture, uh, we access it, and this is in the case of the Quran, with the fundamental assumptions about it. <clears throat> uh, that could be that the Quran is divine, so the word of God, or the Quran is, was authored by Muhammad, or was authored by someone else. So this is what I call fundamental assumption, because it actually shapes your possibilities. Absolutely. It restricts what you can think of. Uh, within that, within that framework, you can have multiple views. So people can believe that the Quran is divine, but have different views about different pieces of text. Then um, they approach the text, study it, and then they come out the other side, uh, presumably the fundamental assumptions uh, intact. So that's what they started with. It's very rare that you change your fundamental assumption because you actually read the piece of text. Uh, but what, what should happen in the case of proper exegesis is that your views, your previous views, become more informed. Uh, they could be modified. You enrich them because you genuinely studied the text, looked at it, and you were happy to change your views if that's what it merited. That's what happens when you act as an exegete. Now, I there's something called Isaac. Isaac Jesus, which I called interpretation despite the text. Now, that's a provocative way of putting it. it and <laughs> this is the same diagram, yeah. exactly the same. There's one difference in these two cases. The other few views only can get confirmed. So you approach the text, not really trying to modify, inform your views, check them. No, it's confirmation bias. You go there. You look at it and say, okay, I am going now to work really hard and find a way of confirming my views. Now, I'm pretty sure if you do a search on the internet, you're not going to find somebody calling themselves eisegist. Nobody does that. Everybody's an exegete. I'm not going to call myself an eisegete, that's for sure. What I'm trying to say, we're human beings. Human beings um, just, we we're not perfect. So we may try our best. But the reality is, at any point in time, there will be an element of what you may call exe eisegesis, as in, because different views we attach to them, not in the same, in the same strength. We are more kind of strongly attached, strongly attached to certain views, less so with others. But generally speaking, scholars or human beings in general, when we say we want to be objective, we mean we want to be more on the side of exegesis, not eisegesis. Now, why I am presenting um, this kind of provo provocative um, picture here, because I am going to conclude that actually denying that the Quran denies the crucifixion is an extreme case of eisegesis. Hmm. Now you're going to hold me to that and see if I can show that or not. There's a, that's very good. And I, there's an, um, an amusing kind of footnote, perhaps. Um, some wag once said about the Old Testament, slightly different subject, that the, uh, a, a Jewish person once said, the way Christians uh, view the Old Testament is a case of eisegesis rather than exegesis, because I see Jesus sounds... I see Jesus sounds like I see Jesus. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <They> literally <laughs> see Jesus all over the Old Testament from Genesis all the way up to Malachi, whatever. And that is uh, an example of eisegesis, which, of course, the Greek means to read into, whereas ex, as you said earlier, ex means to read out of. So you're pouring your interpretation into the Bible rather than letting it speak. So these people see Jesus everywhere, but it's not there. They're adding it. They're putting it into the text according to that Jewish wag I referred to. Yeah. And, and I should add a note here, uh, Paul. We are discussing one particular issue. My conclusions uh, are not intended to generalize the work of any one particular scholar we may mention or come across. I'm talking just about how a particular issue is dealt with. Yep. All of the people we're going to mention here, I respect and I value their works. There's an element of disagreement, though, on this particular point, just to make that clear. OK, so uh, we spoke about the consensus, and we showed that Muslims had absolutely no question about that. 
uh, we could also find early Christian sources that confirm that this is what the Muslims understood uh, to have happened to Jesus. But that consensus uh, has, be, has come under questioning in relatively recent times. And I'm going to mention the main kind of figures, if you like, in this movement um, and use them as milestones to define what happened here. Now, one major name here is Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who from India is a reformist scholar. Sayyid Ahmad Khan, writing the second half of the 19th century, suggested that Jesus was crucified. He's a Muslim scholar, was crucified, but he did not die. According to him, Jesus was left three, four, five hours on the cross, was taken down by his disciples, taken away, hidden somewhere so the Jews cannot find him. And he recovered uh, and then basically lived. Uh, so his interpretation is that he was crucified, but he did not die. Sayyid Ahmad Khan was a rationalist. He differed um, with just about you know, every Muslim scholars in the sense that he did not, for instance, believe in miracles the way we believe in them. Muslims usually believe in them. Uh, he treated them or explained them in a rational way, naturally, but not, not supernaturally. That's what he did. And that includes things like the virginal conception, for instance. So all of those. And um, he was a reformist. He was a well-known scholar. Um, and obviously there were some scholars followed after him, so picked up from where he left and adopted it. Uh, what Sayyid Ahmad Khan spoke about, the idea wasn't actually his, as in he was not the first person to come up with this non-fatal crucifixion theory. Uh, this appeared first at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century in Germany. It was suggested by two German scholars. And uh, it looks to me, because he was uh, well acquainted with Western works, so he might have picked up from there and tried to introduce more rationalism, if you like, in the Muslim uh, statement and belief on this particular issue. Uh, another name that's definitely worth mentioning is Jeffrey Parander. He wrote a book called Jesus and the Quran. Very good book. Um, you agree, disagree with it. It's a really good book. Uh, probably one of its, the first of its kind in Western scholarship, uh, very um, balanced, well researched. Jeffrey Parinder was um, um, a professor of comparative religion, um, King's College, London. Uh, he uh, he died, I think, in two thousand five. Oh, right. um, yeah. And in his book, he again uh, suggested that in fact Jesus was not uh, was crucified and died. And the Quran does not deny that. The other name, significant name that should be mentioned here is Muhammad Ayyub. Muhammad Ayyub was um, a Lebanese scholar, um, I think of Sh Shia. Uh, he converted to Christianity at some point and apparently reverted back to Islam. Um, in 1980, he published a paper called toward an Islamic Christology, in which he was really quite emphatic, and we will come to him more in more detail later, that the Quran does not deny uh, the crucifixion. Um, he's significant because he's a Muslim scholar, and because he's actually quoted quite a bit. Um, um, he's, you know, we should, he actually died last year. Um, very good scholar. And then we come to uh, the most recent of mm -hmm. these names is Todd Lawson, um, emeritus professor, I think at Toronto University. And he published a book called The Crucifixion and the Quran. Yeah. Uh, he published it in 2010. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, that's what the cover looks like. Uh, which I, I read this book. Um, it's often cited these days um, in discussions about this question. So, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, this book is actually published in 2010, but it was based on two part paper. Or he published uh, a decade earlier, which it was itself uh, developed from his MA thesis, which he did in 1980. The significance of Lawson's work is that it's become a kind of um, a frequent, frequent reference point for those who argue that the Quran um, does not deny the crucifixion. Yeah. And 
uh, we must add that he actually introduced a new angle to the discussion that the uh, other scholars uh, did not. And that's why probably he uh, became more kind of popular. These are, obviously, there are other people who spoke and wrote about the subject. I'm, I'm citing what I consider to be particularly significant figures uh, in this movement, but of course, there are other people. Now, the, what Todd Lawson did is that he um, looked at early uh, Muslim works and he showed that at the beginning of the fourth century, uh, there were some Muslim scholars who actually accepted the crucifixion of Jesus. So accepted that Jesus was crucified. Uh, the earliest of these was the Abu Hatim al-Razi, uh, and I need to clarify so there's no confusion. This is not Abu Bakr al-Razi, the atheist, who was contemporary to him, nor uh, the uh, Greek scholar Fakhreddin al-Razi, who uh, was a seventh century scholar. Uh, so uh, he collected a number of, um, uh, reviewed a number of works, the earliest of which, like I say, go, uh, goes to the uh, fourth century, early fourth century, uh, by Abu Hatim Razi. Now, the, the one thing you would have noticed here is that uh, this is a quite a late piece of work. So that work appeared quite late um, in, in three centuries or so. Uh, the second point to make is that all these works belong to the Ismaili school of thought. So this are Ismaili. It's a, it's a smaller branch of Shiism who believe in seven imams rather than 12. The 12 Im, uh, imam, uh, the Shias who believe in 12 imams are what you find in Iran, Iraq. They are the majority. But this, these are Ismaili uh, theologies. Uh, can, can I just clarify for the sake of my own thoughts here and the sake, perhaps the sake of the viewers as well? So you're saying that Todd uh, Lawson is saying in his book, now, the fourth century, just to clarify, you mean the fourth century after Hijra? This is how the Islamic calendar works. Yes, sorry, yes. So yes. We're not talking so, about so, uh, the fourth century AD, obviously. We're talking about the fourth century after yeah. Hijra, after uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the companions went up to Medina in that great sort of uh, exodus from uh, yes. Mecca. So the four, four centuries after that, you are saying, we see the first time that um, a, a Muslim source, the Ismaili source Correct. in this particular instance, ever mentions the idea that Jesus himself uh, was in fact crucified in, on the cross, according Correct. to the, the understanding Correct. of the Quran. So we have a huge Correct. three, four centuries gap from, from the time of the Prophet, the Hadith, companions, the Sahaba, the successors, and on and on, all the way up. have to wait to the four centuries after. Then we get this claim by this small, well, today it's a small group, but then perhaps it was larger uh, group that, in fact, Jesus was crucified, according to the Quran. Is that a crude but fair summary of what you've said? Uh, it's very accurate, uh, very fair summary. Uh, okay. Paul, not only that, um, if we pick the earliest of these, Abu Hatim or Razi, Abu Hatim, first of all, let me just continue with this point that uh, yeah, those please. Smaili theologians were clearly influenced by that particular theology, if you yes, like. The question is, well, why, why this group? But why this particular niche group? Who they're not the Twelvers, you know, they don't believe it. They're not the, the mainstream Shia. Why this particular niche theology? What, what, what what's going on there? You're, you're about to explain what, why they particularly might have claimed this, as opposed to the broader uh, Sunni community, for example. Yeah, they have their uh, kind of their own kind of theology that differs from the rest. Um, it's based on the on the uh, on the number seven. So they have seven imams. There are seven phases. Uh, they also believe in the concept of uh, the qaim or mahdi, uh, the awaited person. And they find, as you know, Jesus also is supposed to return. That's that's a, a, a belief um, yep. that's um, upheld by many Muslim, most Muslims. Mm -hmm. So it, they kind of found a way of integrating those their theology with this concept. In the case of, to give one example, 
Um, but, but these are not only always influenced by their kind of um, theological work. If you take Abu Hatim al-Razi, Abu Hatim al-Razi, in the work that uh, Lawson uh, quotes, he was actually debating with Abu Bakr al-Razi. Abu Bakr al-Razi was a contemporary of his, but he was an atheist. The, this atheist, uh, Razi, made the claim, he said, well, religions cannot be true because they actually differ on just about everything. So what Abu Hatim al-Razi tried to do is to show him, no, they actually don't. They agree on a lot of things. And he presented the case of the crucifixion of Jesus, which was one of the points they were debating, as no, you don't need to look at it um, uh, as, as, as a point of difference. Yes, the Jews say we killed them. Christ Christians say the same. And actually the Quran also says that. What's interesting here is that that happens in a non-exegetical exegetical work. So that's basically some kind of a discussion piece of work. The same person, Abu Hatim al-Razi, has a different book. That book is more of interpretation of the Quran in which he accepts that the Quran uh, denies the crucifixion. Right. Now, that is not mentioned in Lawson's work, which is why the incomplete kind of presentation can be a bit misleading to those who are reading about the subject. So, Abu oh, Hatim al-Razi... Well, but why would the Ismaili theology have an issue with Jesus's, uh, well, not have an issue with Jesus' crucifixion? Well, what, what, what's, what's the theological motivation behind this novel interpretation? It's, it has it's something to do with, I mean, I can't speak with a lot of detail about it, but it's something to do with their, like I said, cosmology and uh, topology and the seven kind of the number seven and the return, the concept of the return of, of their imam. Um, and it's it just linked it that way. If you look, if you look at one of, the, of these books, let's say uh, Sajistani's work, which again, it's another kind of more or less contemporary to Abu Hatim al-Razi. And you look at it, it's a quite, it's a difficult kind of complex um, piece of work. I'm pretty sure someone else who's more kind of, um, accomplished when it comes to the theology can present it and explain it better. Mm. Uh, but what I can say about it is that it's clearly linked to their theology. Second, they are inconsistent in that view. So the view is found in works that are not exegetical. They are actually not. Well, so if you want to read about uh, what Muslim, uh, the interpretation of the Quran, you don't usually pick a book on, let's say, general fiqh or Jusub you know, jurisprudence, uh, mm -hmm. you pick a book that deals with uh, the interpretation of the Quran, exegesis, Tabari or someone else. Mm -hmm. And like I say as well, that those, the same figure seem, seem to have uh, kind of adopted two different views depending on the context in which the discussion was taking place. Okay. And that's what I meant here by contradictory. So even though uh, Todd Lawson introduced new information to the debate, which is the basically existence uh, of those scholars. Uh, it just it still has a quite few issues with it, and you look at it and you it raises questions uh, that makes you wonder. So why did they wait until? the fourth century, oh, yeah. why other Shias did not join in that, because other Shias, the, the general um, uh, view of Shia scholars is that uh, he was not crucified. Right. So the 12 are Shias, the, 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 the great bulk of Shias uh, agree with the, the Sunni perspective and the, the Quran, obviously, that he wasn't crucified. It's just this particular uh, sect, if you like. Uh, suddenly in the fourth century, they appear to have or some of them appear to have contradictory um, views, but uh, at least some of them uh, questioned that reading. So this is a new yeah. thing in a, as yeah. a small sect. Uh, OK. Yeah. And, and the other question also to kind of to try and deal with it, why do they do that? Why are they trying to question the consensus? Yeah. Now, we're going to get to that, but there is, what do we do with then with this verse that seems to suggest that the Jews did not kill him? So how do you deal with that? Well, the kind of general uh, view here is that what the Quran, the alternative view they present is that the Quran is not denying that those uh, the Jews uh, killed uh, Jesus, but they are denying their 
culpability, responsibility, meaning by that, it was ultimately God who allowed the Jews to kill Jesus. So the verse, as it stands, it does mean that the Jews killed Jesus, but it's reminding them, God is reminding them, well, you killed him, but it's actually because I allowed you to kill him, mm. not because you think. So that's the alternative interpretation uh, that is presented for this verse. Okay? Okay. Right. Now, we've been talking about the interpretation of different scholars here. What we, uh, obviously, uh, we have a huge um, literature corpus of writings on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu as well as historical accounts of what he did. The question is, what was his interpretation of this particular verse? And I'm, I'm actually, uh, I would like to ask you a question here, Paul. What do you think, would the Prophet, would he have spoken about the crucifixion or not? We know that he uh, debated with the Christians, with Jews, and the Quran tells us that as well. So do you think this subject would have, would have come up at all or was avoided for whatever reason? Well, in, indeed, it, it's, uh, th this question would have uh, come up. Uh, as you say, there are narrations where he did meet with Christians, even in, in the mosque. They were invited in to ha have discussions over several days. So um, if he had spoken clearly, um, it, it, well, we, we would have had trace of it in the tradition. If there was something surprising, for, shall we say, or against the, the Muslim consensus, we would have heard about it. Uh, but you're going to tell me that, I'm sure. You're going to clarify. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Think about it. This is a major issue because it's, at the, it's the foundation of Christian theology. Hmm. Uh, so if, it must have come up at some point in, in a discussion. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, must have said something about it. Yeah. Yet, what's interesting, um, there is no, uh, no trace of that. There's no um, reference to the Prophet talking about this particular issue anywhere. Mm. Now, let's think about it. If it was controversial, if it was unclear, if there was any doubt about it, if there was any ambiguity about it, surely it would have become the subject of discussion of some form. He would have needed to come out to say, oh, by the way, this verse, even though it looks like it says he wasn't crucified, actually he was, but it means X, Y, Z. None of this whatsoever. Is it possible that this interpretation was lost? I don't think so. Why is that? Because let's say he spoke about it, and for whatever reason, Muslim um, historians, scholars, failed to record it. But don't you think the Christian theologians would have recorded it? Because they would have wanted to use it in the discussion, and then it would have come up at some point, they would have gone, gone to the Muslims and said, your prophet said one day so-and-so. But indeed, you've already quoted from this guy, this monk, John of Damascus, um, who was a, a century or so uh, later in the life of the prophet. And, and he's actually a doctor of the church. I mean, he's a really senior theologian and scholar in, in, the, in the church. And he, he doesn't contradict the Muslim consensus at all. I mean, he would have said so because I mean, he worked for Muslims. He was part of the, the empire at the time. He was right in there and he would have known. Um, and he reports no view uh, to the contrary the one you're uh, advocating, it seems. Yeah. And uh, obviously the other question, is it possible that later scholars changed it? Well, again, forget about the fact that there's no trace of it, but why would Muslim scholars want to change that? First of all, the crucifixion of Jesus, if he was crucified, would not have made any difference to Islamic theology because it has, the Islamic theology has no concept of redemption in the way uh, it's accepted in the Christianity. So it had no threat, if you like, to the Islamic faith. The other point, which is really significant to remember, the Quran does talk about the killing of prophets. It does mention prophets were killed. So the concept is not a taboo to Muslims, and it would not have 
a kind of defamed those prophets, if you like, if they were killed, if Jesus was killed. Yeah. Absolutely not. And indeed, all, all of these scriptures, the, the Jewish Bible that we have now, the New Testament and the Quran, all state that the, the prophets were killed in, in, large, in large numbers, actually. So this is something that all three scriptures agree with, that uh, prophets were killed. And, and sometimes in the, in, the, in the Bible, there are mass murders of prophets in some sections. There seems to be multiple murders of prophets. So uh, this is something that actually everyone agrees with. The prophets were killed. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely both. Hmm. So let's move now to talk about why scholars have started to question the denial of the Quran of the crucifixion. One motive is that they try to bring together Muslims and Christians. Hmm. And I'm going to quote from two theologians, Christian theologians, uh, to show what is what underlines that. So here we go. Uh -huh. So one of them says, those two verses um, has become an important exegetical site for repairing the broken relationship between Christianity and Islam. Uh, authors with this goal have hoped to shift attention away from the Quran's supposed denial of the crucifixion and instead attempt to find common ground in its uh, affirmation in Q158, meaning the uh, taking or uh, uh, raising Jesus. That's what he's talking about. Um, Christian scholars hoping to present the Quran in a more positive light to Christian readers have labored to prove that these verses need to not to be interpreted as a denial of the crucifixion. I like, as a fantastic and, I like the word labored there. Uh, that the, these yes. scholars have labored to prove. It's not, it's not just oh, really hard. They've had to really put a lot of effort to make sure this interpretation is not interpreted in the crucifixion. The word labor, I think, is very interesting. Mm. Absolutely. And uh, again, this is again from a professor from the University of Rochester. As you can see, these verses affirm the death and resurrection of Christ. Wow. Now, yeah, yeah that, you can see wow. where this is going. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. so, yeah. so, so, it, it, so what starts off with the Christians wanting rapprochement, you know, which might sound really quite good, ends up with the, the Christians saying, aha, the Quran, after all, affirms our beliefs, our faith in the death and resurrection of Christ. What a coincidence. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and also, the, let's just look at it this it kind of a little more uh, closely. So you have the Muslims who believe that Jesus was not crucified, mm. but then they believe that he was such a noble prophet, a unique prophet, uh, described in the most beautiful terms in the Quran. Uh, some of the miracles attributed to him are not attributed to any other or linked with any other prophet. No one else is described as uh, was uh, having born out of virginal conception, for instance, or other terms and descriptions in the Quran. So it's yeah. such a very special uh, prophet in the Quran. The only thing that Muslims uh, kind of don't say about Jesus is that he was crucified. So they spare him the humiliation uh, of the crucifixion. On the other hand, so that supposedly is a problem. Uh, to the relationships between Muslims and uh, Christians. On the other hand, on the other side, Christians in general, of course, believe that uh, Muhammad wasn't a genuine prophet, charlatan, effectively fra fraudster, made up the Quran, etc. I was completely confused, if not deliberate, he was just not, came up with this thing that he called a new religion, which was wrong, false, evil, etc. Now, if we want <clears throat> to try and bring these two views closer to each other, which one really would we need to work on? Would we want to convince the Muslims to accept that this noble, kind of much rever revered prophet has to be kind of considered to have died on the cross? Or do we need actually to convince our Christian brothers and sisters that how about accepting that Muhammad might be actually genuine a prophet with genuine message. And that's, that's a problem here. Um, and you look at it and say, well, that's not fair, is it? Um, but that's one, one way of looking at it. The other way, going beyond that, I mean, uh, uh, Professor Neil Robinson called, it, uh, called these attempts as in 
um, disingenuous in the extreme on the part of Christian theologians to try and show that, because the agenda is clear here. Now, if you go kind of a little bit, uh, look at it from a different angle, I really don't believe that uh, those relationships are broken because Muslims don't believe that Jesus was crucified. The reality is that uh, Christians um, fought among themselves, Muslims didn't do, other religions did the same. Theology is only one pretext that was used in those conflicts. Those conflicts are mostly um, political, economic. It's about conflict of interest. Uh, if we uh, convinced all Muslims uh, to accept that Jesus was crucified, do we really believe that will suddenly turn the relationship between Christians and Muslims, uh, take it to a completely different level? On the basis of what? There's no, it just, it's kind of really, it's a, it's a Christian agenda, theological agenda. Unfortunately, there's no real substance behind it other than that. That's, that's, I, 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 you make a good point. I just, just note, by the way, that um, in Judaism um, uh, and in the Jewish scriptures, there was no expectation that the Messiah would be crucified and died. Or, and, and raised to death. This is not a view that's found anywhere in the Jewish sources or in the Jewish Bible uh, prior to Christianity itself, which obviously then did have that view. Um, so it's not just Quran that's problematic, allegedly. It's also the Christian claim that the Messiah who was to come, who was to do this, would be was expected to be crucified. That, that, that view is absent from the Jewish scriptures, and no Jew expected that. Uh, according to our historical records, there's no Jew prior to Christianity who was ever expecting that to happen. So it's a new thing, an unexpected uh, um, and unlooked for. And, and on the contrary, the Messiah was supposed to be victorious. He's not supposed to be humiliated and degraded by crucifixion. And Muslims agree, it seems, that indeed he wasn't. So, um, Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, as you know, in Corinthians, um, Paul called it as tumbling block to Jews, the concept of suffering Messiah. He yeah. just, he wouldn't have it. It was a problem for Jews to convert to Christianity yeah. if that's what it, what it meant. You're absolutely well, right. They weren't expecting it. It's not prophesied. Yeah. No, no, absolutely not. <clears throat> now, there's a completely different motive behind trying to deny the denial of the crucifixion in the Quran. This is an Islamic agenda now, which is, we spoke about Christian agenda. This is an Islamic agenda. And this is a quote from uh, Mahmoud Ayyub. Why then, it must be asked, does the Quran deny the crucifixion of Christ in the face of apparently overwhelming evidence? Meaning what he means is that it's clearly Historically speaking, Jesus was crucified. Why would the Quran deny that? And then he goes on to say Muslim commentators have not been able to convincingly to disprove the crucifixion. Well, I, that's something we can get to later. I don't know how you can prove or disprove the crucifixion, but you can't disprove a historical event as such, strictly speaking. Rather, they have compounded the problem by adding the conclusion of their substitutionist theories. What he's talking about is the general uh, kind of widely accepted interpretation among Muslims is that Jesus, there was a crucifixion, but it wasn't Jesus, it was someone else. Who was crucified? Uh, so he's referring to that. He's crucifying that concept. Yeah. Someone else. Yeah. yeah. And and then he goes on. The problem has been, we believe, one of understanding. So now he's gonna proceed to make a really big statement. Commentators, they're talking Muslim commentators, have generally taken the verse to be a historical statement. That's the statement on uh, Jesus. They did not. They did not kill him, uh, nor did they crucify him. This is statement. He says, like all other statements concerning Jesus in the Quran, belongs not to history, but to theology in the broadest sense. Uh, wow. I guess, where do we start here? Uh, the, 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 what he's saying effectively, he's accepting the historicity of the crucifixion. And because he's accepting that, and he's implying that Quran is the word of God, and I, why would it actually deny the historicity? Uh, then uh, uh, commentators, exegetes must have misunderstood the Quran 
uh, for let's say 14 centuries. Um, and then, but he goes on further and he says, this statement is actually should be understood about Jesus and all other statements about Jesus should be understood in kind of theological sense rather than historical sense. Now, can, can, what can, he's doing here is something... Can I, can I, before you go, uh, I mean, I'm not going to comment on this passage, just to make this strikes me, that last sentence belongs not to history, but to theology in the broadest sense. This language almost, I, I recognise it, you often find it in Christian interpreters' commentaries on, on, this, on yeah. the Bible, in their hermeneutics. Yeah. This is a very kind of Christian theme. Oh, well, you know, this event in the Bible, well, belongs not to history, but maybe... A, more, it's more to do with theology. So we can still believe it, but we don't believe it happened, so to speak. So yeah. this is this has a whiff of, of uh, Christian hermeneutics about it to, to me. Uh, I mean, absolutely. Kind of really, that's what it sounds like. It's certainly not an Islamic view, but it, it may be a more of a Christian uh, hermeneutic. So I just wanted to get that off my chest. Absolutely, Paul. Absolutely. You're, you're spot on. I think, um, I, I, as I mentioned, uh, Muhammad Ayyub uh, actually converted to Christianity. And then he went back to Islam. So whether that was, you know, mm. you know, influenced by uh, that conversion experience, I don't know. But that's um, that was said. What's interesting here is you've just spoken about the concept of the suffering Messiah. It's not historical. So what he's saying effectively, well, what the Quran says is not historical. What the Gospels say is historical, yet, yet, what the Gospels say is actually, according to history, is not historical. <laughs> because if Jesus was the Messiah, mm -hmm. the Messiah are, is not supposed to die uh, the way he, he did anyway. So he's basically turned it upside down. Mm -hmm. Then, if that wasn't enough, he goes on to say everything that the Quran says about Jesus is actually theological, should not be understood yeah. As historical. Very strange. Well, I think the problem here is well, if you treat why Jesus, why not Moses? Moses is mentioned more than any other prophet in the Quran. Mm. Now, if you follow this line of thinking, the Quran becomes basically open to just about any interpretation. And it's very difficult to see how two different people can get the same meaning out of the text if actually it goes that far. Mm. These are statements according to the Quran, are supposed to be statements of fact. So, so there are statements about faith, theology, um, you know, things that we can't see, the spirit, spiritual world, uh, paradise, etc. And there are statements about history, about the past. When the Quran um, talks about the past, it claims to be re reporting history, not to be making some kind of general theological statements that yeah. have the appearance of history to it. Yeah, very strange. Another point to raise here, Paul, mm. is that now the concept of a suffering Messiah is of no significance to Muslims. So which one is likely to have fallen in the theological trap here? The Muslims or the Christians? It's, it looks like um, uh, Christians to me. Um, so these are two motives, you can kind of major motives. One um, is Christian and the other is Islamic. I would like to mention there are some smaller kind of um, attempts as well uh, to deny the denial of the crucifixion of the Quran. For instance, in a recent paper by John Cole, um, an excellent scholar, uh, he also said that uh, the Quran is actually denying some kind of propaganda statement made by the Sasanians about um, the Jews killing uh, Jesus because it was demoralizing uh, to the Christians. And the Quran kind of came out in, in, in defense of that. Now, obviously, these are kind of speculations um, right. yeah. and, and theories can be, you know, can be developed. But I think what I hope to show as we progress further is that it's really very hard to, um, you know, to stick to this interpretation that the Quran does not deny the crucifixion. Now, there's a problem here uh, for if somebody believes that uh, the Quran was uh, is divine, um, was inspired by God, then they would argue that the Quran is correct, Jesus was not crucified, 
um, and, um, and, and the crucifixion story is just um, false. But for those who think that uh, the Quran was uh, authored by Muhammad, there's actually a problem there. So if Muhammad wrote the, uh, the Quran, here's the question. There are actually serious issues for him, something that both groups who are concerned with Jesus agree on. So the Jews say, we killed him, mm. and the Christians say, we killed him. He's at the same time trying to attract both groups. The killing of, the Christ, of Jesus is of no significance to him, to the Quran, he trying to unify all of those, yet he comes out with what looks like a statement that stands in the face of history. Everybody he knew, every Jew, every Christian, believed that Jesus was crucified. And he's trying to tell them, we believe in the same God. I believe in the Torah, in the Injil. Jesus is so-and-so. Moses is so-and-so. However, what you say about this particular issue, I'm disagreeing with. What think, sense does that make? I think it's actually a very, very good point. I mean, there's even that verse in the Quran that says to people in the book, let, let us come to common terms. He's inviting them to come to an agreement. So the emphasis here is on consensus. Let us understand what we share in common. And then you come across this verse, which is so counterintuitive in some ways, if, particularly if you're a Christian, um, in, in denying the crucifixion. So why would Muhammad, inverted commas, being the supposed author of the Quran, what motive would he have for including a verse which really puts the, the, the spoke in the wheels of, of this whole agenda of let us agree, let us come, come to common terms? doesn't make any sense, as you say. Absolutely. It, it basically dents um, the credibility of the Quran because they think this is a, a simple, basic historical fact. How do we know? Well, the Quran since then, has always been criticized on this particular point. The, the claim, the historic claim that has received the most criticism from scholars, non-scholars, is the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, he comes out and basically puts out a statement that he'd make kind of, if you like, threaten his whole message and, and, yeah. and mission. Because this, this is an indirect argument for the authenticity of the prophet. Because if he was a charlatan, if he was a fake, a fraud, then he wouldn't use a verse, of course, which threatened to jeopardize his successful proselytizing of, of Christians, for example. What, why would he do that? He would, you know, no, no one would do that. So that kind of suggests indirectly that, that he is uh, putting the truth over uh, any interest to, uh, of uh, a self-aggrandizement or any fraudulent claim to prophethood. That, that, Paul, unless you actually go out to try and prove that the Quran does not deny the crucifixion. Hmm. So that's one way out of this dilemma. So we are in a corner, but there is a way out of it if we actually say the Quran does not deny the crucifixion. Um, any advantages of denying the crucifixion? Well, history tells us none, absolutely none. 14th century of criticism, disagreement, um, uh, you know, accusing the credit of the Quran, absolutely none. That's that's really what we uh, what we have here. Okay. Now, Jesus and Mary in the Talmud. Where where does this fit in what we're talking about? Um, one argument that was used to show that the Quran does not deny the crucifixion is to link it to some statements in the Talmud and to say it was actually engaging with the Talmud and that is the, um, and that's what it was doing and it's not denying actually uh, the, uh, the killing of Jesus itself. So I'm gonna go through um, a couple of um, statements from the Talmud and then we see how these kind of uh, link into the discussion we have. Okay. I just want to very briefly, just to share, and just to clarify what the Talmud is, uh, is obviously a Jewish uh, collection of writings. Uh, very simplistically, in, in five seconds, it includes what's called the oral Torah. So the written Torah, you know, the first five books of Moses. The Talmud includes 
the oral Torah, an oral revelation given to Moses, plus a whole bunch of rabbinic, r- r- the rabbis having conversations and arguments and discussions um, about what this is. And there are many, many volumes. There's the Babylonian Talmud, there's the Jerusalem Talmud, but the Babylonian one is the big one in Babylon, uh, in modern Iraq, of course, and uh, uh, and it's st- studied by Jews today all around the world. You can study it online or on, on an app on your iPhone. Um, so th- this is what and it was written perhaps over several hundred years from, from I won't go into all the details, but that's kind of very crudely, I think, what it's about. Absolutely. And, and I, I should add that uh, the quotes that we have uh, are specifically from the Babylonian Talmud because this was not censored. Unlike uh, the Talmud of J- Jerusalem, which was effectively and uh, uh, Christian okay. down, and they had to be yeah. careful about what they say. So what you're going to see now are all from B stands for Talmud, and Shabbat is a book from um, from the Talmud. So what I have, wh- what you have here is it's a quite unique kind of format you have in the Talmud, as you know, Paul, a discussion among uh, Jewish scholars. It's quite a unique kind of uh, format, and this is a discussion about. Uh, somebody called Ben Stada, uh, but at times he's called uh, Ben Pandera. Ben means son of. Um, and as you can see, uh, scholars think that Stada and Pandera uh, are potentially names uh, for um, Jesus, referred to Jesus, Ben Stada, Ben Pandera. So here you have, uh, somebody is asking, did uh, Ben Stada not bring forth witchcraft from Egypt uh, by mean of scratches, um, meaning on the skin, some kind of um, practice of sorcery. Um, and then another says he was fool, answered, uh, and the proof cannot be adduced from fools. Was then the son, uh, was he then the son of Stada? So that's one suggestion. He's son of somebody called Stada. But then another replies, um, or, you know, a reply to that statement, he was the son of Pandera, maybe. Uh, one uh, sage goes on to say the husband was Stada, so the husband of his mother was called Stada, and uh, the lover was Pandera. Uh, and then you have another statement, husband was Papos ben Judah, uh, the mother was Stada. You have another confusion here, it's just you can see the names are a bit confused, um, but then uh, the mother is called Miriam, Miriam Mary, the hairdresser. And then uh, this Mary is, uh, is told, is said to have been unfaithful to her husband. Most scholars uh, accept that Ben Pandera is a reference to Jesus. Uh, some accept Ben Stad as well, uh, but the majority Ben Pandera. Pandera is a name that was used by the Romans. It is particularly um, uh, found um, used uh, for Roman soldiers, which is why uh, son of um, you know Ben Pandera, Pandera was supposedly a Roman soldier who had a relationship with Mary, and Jesus effectively was uh, the product of this illicit uh, relationship. And this is a quote uh, from um, a Christian theologian from the third century, Oregon, and he's quoting a Greek critic uh, of Christianity called Celsus. And uh, according to Celsus, he's talking about what the Jews said about Jesus. Uh, when she was pregnant, his mother, she was turned out of doors by the carpenter to whom she had been betrothed as having been guilty of adultery and that she bore a child to a certain soldier now named Pantera. Pantera, Pandera, these are the same, uh, the same name. Um, In fact, even uh, Tertullian, the Christian author from the second century, also uh, referred to a Jewish belief that Jesus was called the son of uh, the carpenter or uh, the harlot. So it's a kind of a quite, uh, and, and it's clear that these accusations are targeted at the virginal conception. So the concept, the Christian concept, which is accepted in the Quran, uh, that uh, Jesus uh, was born of virginal uh, conception. Now, as for the crucifixion itself, there's actually only one passage in the Talmud that talks about it. And I have quoted it here and highlighted certain parts of it. 
So on the eve of the Passover, Yeshua, said Jesus, was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, he's going forth to be stoned because he, had, he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve, on the eve of the Passover. This is the only statement uh, about, the, um, about Joshua here. There's another one that kind of links uh, this particular passage with the passage about um, Ben Stada uh, and uh, Ben Pandera. But this is really the main passage we're talking about. As you can see, this doesn't actually match the, the story in the Gospels. Um, the 40 days thing. Yes, there's the Passover, there's Joshua, there's no stoning involved. You've got stoning here. Um, what those who link the Quran to this account say is that you have mention of stoning and hanging. And this kind of dual punishment matches the double denial in the Quran. Mm. He was not... They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. Mm. And I think I'm the question terribly, is... I'm terribly impressed with right. it. <laughs> it's not, right. there's, there's no strong argument at all. It all sounds very uh, uh, tenuous and uh, un unpersuasive, I think. Yeah. And, and if you look at it, uh, first of all, uh, the Quran talks about stoning. It doesn't, uh, about other kind of uh, instances of stoning, the, the term exists in the Quran. It's never used in the case of Jesus. But, I mean, what we have here is really four word statement in Arabic by the Quran. These are four words. And we have a huge passage of 370 words or so in one English translation. And we're trying to say those four words somehow are linked to the story. This story is so detailed. None of those details are accepted by the Quran. For instance, take this piece, which is not quoted, by the way, um, in the previous passage, but it's part of it. Uh, the same passage names five disciples of Joshua. These are Matia, Nakai, Nazar, Benu, uh, Buni, and Toda. Now, only five. And then it goes on to say um, that they were executed like, um, you know, their teacher. Obviously, this is just, I'm citing one example to show, well, linking those four words in the Quranic verse to this passage. I mean, if you do that, you frankly, you can well, just link anything in the Quran to just about any text. Mm. It doesn't even need to be scripture. Now, let's just think about how much the Qur'an could have actually engaged with the Talmud. We know from the Qur'an that uh, uh, the, it engaged with the beliefs of a variety of people. Uh, it engaged with the Jews, Christians, um, uh, the, those who uh, worshipped idols, and also talks about actually ancient um, nations as well. So it talks about all of those. In its engagement with all of that, the focus of the Qur'an is actually the belief itself. So what these people are saying, it doesn't engage with the history of that belief. It doesn't kind of follow where this come from, etc. None of that. That's not really of a kind of subject of interest uh, in the Qur'an. The Qur'an only focused on this is true, this is not true. It doesn't say, oh, this came from here, this came from The other thing is, um, the, as you uh, mentioned about the Talmud, the Talmud was written over centuries, uh, completed probably in the 5th, 6th century. Now, the concept or the belief that Jesus uh, was not born of virginal conception, uh, that Jesus was crucified by the Jews, clearly these are beliefs that the Jews at the time held about Jesus. All the Talmud did is to document those beliefs. So the, the passages in the Talmud about Jesus and Mary, the earliest ones are believed to go back to the third, third century. 
So you have third century, there's no one, no one would say that those beliefs started at the time of the Talmud. So when the Quran was engaging with those beliefs, it was, enga it was engaging with what Jews believed over the centuries. It, the Talmud was effectively irrelevant to this discussion whether it was written, not written, how many of, of these Jews actually had access to the Talmud, that's a different story. But it was just engaging with the belief itself. The Quran mentions four scriptures as well, names them. Uh, the Torah of Moses, Injil of Jesus, and Zabur of Dawud. Zabur is another word for book, and Suhuf of uh, Abraham, um, Ibrahim. Suhuf means um, uh, pages. So again, uh, talks, uh, mm. Sohof, yes, um, um, the, the singular is Sahifa. Uh, so what you have here is, um, is, is, is books being named, mentioned specifically. Now the Quran does say uh, the Jews tampered with um, certain scripture, wrote something and they called it scripture, etc. But it doesn't name any particular uh, book there. But these books are specifically mentioned in the Quran. The point I'm trying to make here, Paul, is that if somebody would like to suggest that the Quran engaged with the Talmud specifically, the burden of proof is on them, not the other way around. They have to show how this was the case when we know everybody believed uh, that Jesus, as in the Jews, did not believe in the virgin of conception and also believe they killed him. That's their beliefs at the time, everybody. The Quran did not need to go and look for where this comes from, actually, and let me kind of engage with that source. Yeah. Okay. When talking about the Quran, um, its arguments, its engagement with the Jews, the Christians, uh, often... When you read some of the um, uh, writings in Western scholarship, you get the impression that we know so much about what went on there, what the situation was, was like. So it's just very easy to develop this idea. And the idea is that, well, um, the Jews had so-and-so uh, beliefs, uh, scriptures, and the Quran engaged with them, meaning was influenced by them uh, one way or another. The reality, however, is this. We don't know who the Arabian Jews were, and we have no idea what type of Judaism they had. Interesting. Nobody, there's no one that can come out and say, well, this is what they believed in. We don't know that. So this is uh, unknown. And further, the, the contact between these um, groups and the early Muslims was not clear. So we don't know how they are interacted in a way. We know they were, you know, they visited each other. But what happened beyond that? What happened to, for us to claim that this is specific book? So did they come, for instance, one day to the Prophet and say, well, here we go. That's the Talmud. And this is what it says. What do you say? And then he would go on, okay, wait for me a few days and I'll let you know. That, that just, there's, there's no information whatsoever. And had there such contact, kind of uh, more details um, existed, as in substantive details, will probably would have been recorded anyway. Um, so, so we don't know what, what, what the relation was. The other thing is, the, the Jews, there is no, we don't, have any evidence that the Jews in Arabia were in possession of the emerging uh, rabbinic writings. So there is no evidence that the Jews in Arabia actually had copies of the Talmud. There's no such proof anywhere. Furthermore, the Talmud itself makes no mention of the, and the Mishnah, make no mention of the Jews in Arabia. The Jews in Arabia, as far as the Talmud and Mishnah are concerned, just don't exist. That's interesting. So yep. that, that vacuum of information makes it really hard and completely speculative to try and develop, you know, 
those kind of detailed links between the Quran and the uh, and those uh, writings and beliefs. Okay. I would mention one particular scholar. I think I would suggest uh, people who would like to read on this subject for is Aaron Hughes, uh, the of the University of um, Rochester. I think he's written on this subject, and it's uh, it, it's worth reading about it for those who are um, interested. There is a concept that I would like to suggest here because it has implications to how you approach the Quran. Um, if somebody doesn't believe that the Quran is, is uh, revealed by God, then obviously it's Muhammad, if not Muhammad, through some means, Muhammad got his information uh, mm. from another party, from a book, etc. But for Muslims, uh, the, uh, the Quran supposedly has direct access to history. Now, this is one verse that I would like to quote here. It's going to say that, talking to the Prophet, say, O oh Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth, Noah of the unseen, ghayb. Ghayb in, in Arabic, uh, a word that stands to anything that we don't know, we don't see, we can't access. So the past is ghayb, the future is ghayb. What we can't see with our eyes, even in our own time, is ghayb. So he's, he's the... Uh, Noah, he knows the ghayb and uh, the whatever, what, what can be witnessed, anything that is visible. The idea here is that the Quran claims to have direct access to history. That's effectively what it means, which means if you have this fundamental belief that the Quran is the word of God, then surely that must be reflected in the way you think about the Quran. This is a challenge for Muslim scholars. This is not for Western scholars. This is mainly for Muslims who believe yeah. in that. So if you look at the following verse, again, talking to Muhammad, this is at the beginning of the uh, chapter of uh, Surah of Yusuf. Yusuf is a very unique chapter because it's the chapter that consists mainly of one story. So it's in this regard, it's unlike anything else. And it's a very detailed story. So we narrate to you, O Muhammad, the best of narratives, and he's talking about the details of the story of uh, Joseph, by revealing this Quran to you. Before it, you were one of the unaware. You did not know before we revealed to you what was there. So this is, again, confirmation that the Quran claims to have direct access to history, and it claims that the Prophet's access to history happened through the Quran, not through any other mean. Yeah. Now, if you're a Muslim scholar and doing historical research, you're going to find face a bit of a dilemma, because if you say the Quran was influenced somehow by uh, that what's going on around it, uh, you have to be careful and not to go further and claim that the Quran has copied from other sources, because the claim here is that it has direct access to, um, to, the, to history. Now, we know from the Quran that uh, the, the Prophet, the, uh, the revelations were at times made as a result of certain encounters. So there are a number of places where it says, Yes, um, Alunak, um, they ask you. So start the verse starts with Yes, Alunak, they ask you, so and so, and then uh, a reply uh, comes forward. So somebody has asked the Prophet about something, and then he replied. So clearly there's engagement here. But the Quran is clear that the reply is coming from God. So the question is coming from people. The information, the reply is coming from God. This model applies to everything that the Quran says, even when it comes to things about faith, uh, beliefs, and history. Okay? Good point. Anything there, Paul? No, no, you, that's a very good point. Okay. Now, I'm going to proceed to show how verses of the Quran have been misused to try and prove that the Quran does not deny the crucifixion. This is quite the common kind of method. This is one verse that's often quoted. This verse talks about something happened at the Battle of Bedr, um, the earliest battle in Medina. 
uh, you or you who have believed did not kill them, as in did not kill the polytheists, but it was Allah who killed them. And then it goes on to talk, to address the prophet, you did not throw when you threw, it was Allah who threw, meaning whatever they were throwing at the enemy, that he might test the believers, etc. What they say, here we have a statement that an action was taken by the prophet and was taken by the believers that Allah is attributing to himself. Similarly, when it denies that the Jews killed or crucified Jesus, what it means is that it was God who crucified him. It was God who killed him. Now, obviously, one obvious problem here is that this verse is explicitly mentions that Allah killed those. It's obviously a metaphor. Mm. So it's saying that it, you took the action, but actually I was behind it. I supported you. It's like I took the action. It's a metaphor. That metaphor does not exist in the non-crucifixion verse. So the crucifixion verse does not say the Jews did not kill Jesus or crucify. It was God who did that. So there's no actually likening these two. It just is not valid. Another point to make here is um, Allah uh, uh, here attributes to himself an act that's intrinsically good, because this is an act by the believers to defend themselves. Yet the act that the Jews were uh, tried to take was intrinsically evil, according to the Quran. Mm -hmm. So it cannot be attributed to God. So theologically, this is not tenable either. So this argument, it doesn't really hold much water. Another verse that was used is this. This is a statement attributed to Jesus in the Quran. This is on me on the day I was born, the day I will die, and the day I'm brought back alive. And they say, because Jesus said, I will die, he must have died. And when did he die? Surely that must have happened uh, when he was crucified. Sorry, Paul, you have something to say. No, no, I was just looking it up in the, please, I was just looking it up in the translation here. Yeah. Sure. Now, what's interesting about this, um, uh, the use of this particular verse, is that it uses the, the word amut. Amut, uh, it's, it's, it's a word for death, die, I die. The Quran di distinguishes between death and murder or being killed. These are two different verbs. If anything, this, ver this verse actually denies the crucifixion because it talks about death. He doesn't say, the day I was born, the day I will be killed. Further uh, on, it says, it, it talks about one, uh, raised, one raising from death. So, they are, so it wasn't like he died, then he was raised um, to heaven, and then he will die again, and then he will be brought back. There isn't. There's just one death and one time that he will be resurrected. So it must refer to the natural death, and it must also mean the time when everybody is brought back to life. And the finally, um, I wanted to mention this. It's an even weaker link, I have to say. Um, it, it talks about the martyrs, the martyrs who are considered to be alive in heaven. And what the people who argue using this uh, verse suggest that in the same way that martyrs uh, were killed, but they are treated as or considered alive, Jesus was also killed, but basically uh, he is alive there. The reality is that just there is no link between this and what the what verse um, 157 says. Now, there are two other verses, and I said that there's only one direct verse that talks about the crucifixion, but there are two verses that talk about it indirectly. Um, this is one of them. Um, this is uh, Allah talking about the children of Israel, and it says um, they planned, talking about the risk to Jesus here, uh, the context, and Allah planned. Allah is the best of planners. Now, clearly, um, what the plan there to is talking about here is a plan against Jesus. So this is a reference, indirect, admittedly, 
but it's a reference to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala foiled, if you like, the plan of the Jews. That's what, what it says here. And it goes on to say, uh, I'm taking you, raising you to me, and the cleansing of those who disbelieve. Now, think about it. What sense would it make if God would, was going to allow Jesus to be uh, tortured, uh, put on through that ordeal, but then uh, to console him by telling him, I will raise your dead body to me. Well, I, whether even if you were Jesus, I don't think that would be much consolation, would it? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a problem here. It doesn't make much sense. And cleansing you of those who disbelieve, in what sense? The body would have been already tortured, damaged. What is left? They would basically, according to the Jewish tradition, they would bury him anyway. So what does it mean, actually, to take that body and cleanse them of those who disbelieve? It can only mean that he was being taken away from them. And if you link this to the earlier statement that Allah is the best of planners as a reply to their plan, then it can only mean he saved them somehow. This is even clearer in the second verse. Yeah. This verse is a dialogue taken from dialogue between God and Jesus. Most scholars think that this happened or will happen on the day of resurrection. A minority, including Tabari, uh, think it happened after he was raised to heaven, after he was saved. Uh, I happen to be uh, in the minority group, but that's different. It's irrelevant whether you believe it will happen on the day of resurrection or it happened after he was raised. The meaning is the same. Uh, God here says, I restrained the children of Israel from you. Now, how can he argue and remind Jesus of his favor that he protected him from the children of Israel? when he's going to shortly allow him to be tortured on the cross. What, what sense would that make? No, I think this, this second verse, particularly uh, Sir Amado 5110, is, is, a very, is very relevant to your presentation uh, because you know, God, God is stating how he protected Jesus from the, uh, the, the Jews. Um, but what sense would that make if ultimately the Jews got their way and crucified him? So... Uh, it, it would be a yeah. very hollow claim to make, um, uh, particularly then with the other verse, 354 as well. So you know, these are good verses that can, can, can be added, adduced to this debate. And, uh, and uh, well, yeah. well, done, well done for highlighting them. And, and Paul, think about it also now, uh, in particular, the second verse. This verse was re revealed, obviously, uh, 600 years after Jesus. Now, if the Muslims believed or the Quran told them that Jesus was crucified. I mean, what would this, what would this sound to them? Mm -hmm. So I restrain the children of Israel from you? Well, they've been supposedly told that he was crucified by the same book. There's no way, it wouldn't make any sense. So if you put it yourself wasn't, in wasn't there. wasn't just saying he was crucified. There, there was, uh, the, the Bible says that Jesus was arrested and tortured and uh, scourged and spat upon and, and then crucified, which is true. Uh, but the Quran says, no, I restrained the children of Israel from you when you came to them uh, with clear proof. So it's, it's, uh, it, it clearly refutes that idea. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, now we're going to move to the um, verse we're after, but I'm going to first look at the kind of context in which it occurs, the non-crucifixion verse. And um, uh, we, uh, the verses leading to that uh, are criticized the Jews for a variety of things. So it says that they demanding, demanded that the prophet would kind of make a book descend on them from heaven, as in to believe that the Quran was from there. Also, it says that, and they asked Moses something even worse, uh, because they wanted him to show them God. Uh, this is actually, there's a mention, something similar in the Old Testament about Moses when he went to uh, Mount Sinai, and he was told, and the Jews were uh, kind of um, instructed not to go past a particular point, and then uh, God sent them back and said, well, they transgressed, etc. So it looks like these are um, the same event, uh, potentially. And also, the Quran criticizing them for taking a, taking a call 
uh, for God and tra transgressing on the Sabbath. The last three are actually mentioned in the New Testament in different places. Uh, not that necessarily relevant here, but uh, just to confirm that. So these two verses are then followed by the immediate context of the verse we're interested in. So here we go. Uh, we curse them. That's what the Quran took. Remember, they, the Quran was criticizing the Jews, and then it goes on to say, we curse them for breaking their covenant, rejecting the signs of Allah, and killing prophets unjustly. And then saying, our hearts are covered, rather Allah has sealed them. Our hearts are covered is a reference to most scholars think it's a, it means that they claim they did not need any knowledge. So when prophets came to them, they didn't need any of that. Uh, their hearts were covered. They have already knowledge. So they did not need uh, any prophet. Now, what's interesting about that is like, look at the first three uh, kind of words that I've highlighted. These are actions that the Jews took. So they broke their covenant they rejected the signs of God, and they killed prophets. So three actions, things they did. The fourth is a saying they claim. So they say so-and-so. So the fourth is denied by the Quran because they clearly, their hearts were not full of knowledge. They did need. So look at the clever and the subtle and accurate, precise distinction in the wording between the first three which are verbs, effectively, obviously in the, you know, in the form of geront here, but they're verbs and, and actions. And the fourth, which is saying. Now, this then leads to this verse. And for their disbelief, and they're saying against Mary a grave slander. Look at the word saying again being used here. It's again confirming any time, every time uh, the Quran distinguishes between an action as saying, the saying means it's a false statement. So they said so-and-so, but it's what it's saying is they said, but it is not true. Yep. Look at the verse in the question. And saying, we have killed the Messiah. Now, when you look at this picture, is there really any doubt as to what the Quran is talking about here. Breaking, rejecting, killing, all of them actions that took place. Saying, 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 all of them are being denied. Mm -hmm. Saying means just claiming. Mm. Furthermore, there's a mention of killing prophets unjustly. Killing prophets unjustly. Now, does it really make any sense for the Quran to accept that the Jews killed Jesus, and then to criticize them for bragging about that. So it's not, it's to criticize them for killing the prophets earlier, but here, apparently, it's to criticize them for bragging about killing Jesus. It doesn't concern itself with the fact that they killed him. No, that's all right. However, to say that we've killed them, that's not acceptable. Is this really reasonable? Any comment here, Paul? No, no, you're doing an excellent job, actually. Very helpful. Just checking in my Abdul Halim okay. translation. Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, now, I'm going to show a Quranic Arabic construct. Um, I believe this has not been published before, but um, this is used in the verse we are concerned with. So the verse goes in Arabic, wama, wama, walakin, meaning, uh, this is the construct we're talking about. Wama means we did not. Walakin, but. We did not, but. And the verse in the question says, Wama, Wama qataluhu, so um, did not kill him. Uh, wama salabuhu, nor did they crucify him. Walakin, but. It was made to appear so to them. And this is the interesting point here. This construct appears in the Quran tens of times, not individual, tens of times, in every single instance of it, what follows wama is, is false, what follows walakin is true. 
Interesting. Interesting. What follows wama is false. What follows walakin is true because walakin is a, is a corrective to the preceding statement. So, but is a corrective here. That's how it's used in the Quran. Tens of verses. Now, this is one example. And they did not wama wrong us. Talking about uh, the wrongdoers. But we, when I can, they were wronging themselves. So whatever evil they did, they had, you know, harmed themselves. They cannot harm us. God is talking about himself. Now, for an Arab who is used to this expression, mm. and which occurs in the Quran tens of times, what sense would it make to be used in the opposite uh, why in that particular how would they know it was meant to be the opposite to what they, what it's used <clears throat> to be yeah no idea mm. okay um, i'm going to go through a quick breakdown of the verse now um, the verse basically the jewish claim is stated we have killed the messiah jesus the son of mary the messenger of allah claim is unambiguously denied they did not kill him nor did they crucify him Confusion is explained, but it was made to appear so to them. Claimants are uncertain. Those who differ over it are in doubt about it. Claims is not based on facts, but guessing and speculation. They have no knowledge of it except the following of conjecture. And then the conclusion is another confirmation that the claim is false and is not based on uncertainty. They did not kill him with certainty. What I'm really doing, just <clears throat> catching the verse from just about every angle I can think of, to try and show for an Arab, how can this be read to mean anything other than denying the crucifixion? How? Now, I'm going to do one last um, analysis of the language. Here's what I'm going to look at. They claim they did X, we have killed the Messiah. They did neither X nor Y. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it appeared to them they did. But it was made to appear to them so. Again, just looking at the structure in a more generic way to show that it can only mean that what, what they claimed was being negated. Finally, the... After denying the crucifixion, God says this about it. Rather, Allah raised him to himself. So this is effectively the alternative to the story that was being claimed by the Jews. What he's saying is that you could not kill him. You did not kill him. You did not crucify him. Rather, instead, Allah raised him to himself. And as you can see, the use of uh, the reference to his invisibility here is to say that you cannot win if you compete with me effectively, because I wanted to save uh, Jesus. Um, finally, just to conclude, I've got a few questions that I hope to have raised here and to mm -hmm. leave everybody to think for themselves and try and to answer them. So where does the balance of arguments lie? I have um, presented every argument I'm aware of that denies the Quran's denial of, of the crucifixion. I don't believe there is anything left outside this presentation. And I have presented mm -hmm. some known arguments and new arguments I've added. The question for anybody is, where do they think the balance of arguments lie. The other question I have, and these are all relevant, is the Quran clear or ambiguous about the crucifixion? What should we expect it to be? What I mean by that, it was such a huge issue for Christians. Hmm. Do we think that the Quran went out of its way to be particularly ambiguous about that? Why would it do that? So it could come out and say he wasn't crucified, he wasn't, which one? So you have to take a view. You can't just sit on the fence and say, well, the Quran is ambiguous, because some scholars have made this argument. It's ambiguous. Yeah, but there's no point in being ambiguous. Why would the Quran do that? It's a lost, lost situation, basically, if it's ambiguous. The other question I would like to ask, 
which of you <clears throat> is more of an interpretation of the text and which of you is more of an interpretation despite the text? Again, I'll leave mm -hmm. that to the audience. Finally, is the Quran supposed to be intelligible or not? I'm an Arab. And if this verse can mean that the Quran does not deny the crucifixion, I would find it really hard to understand the Quran. Yeah. I'd find it really difficult to read and comprehend because the, I'm talking about the basics of Arabic here. And that what underlines that consensus, not because Muslim scholars hated the concept of crucifixion. They knew that prophets were killed, not for any other reason other than they saw it just clear statement, alternative to which never existed. So nobody actually uh, propagated the alternative view. And that's why we have this consensus. And uh, thank you very much, Paul. Sorry, I might have taken a bit longer than no, no, it, it's, uh, it's, it's thorough, academic, scholarly, and um, covering all the bases, as we say, which is, um, which is really helpful. So thank you so much uh, for that um, thorough, academic, uh, scholarly pres presentation. I personally find it compelling. Um, I was aware of the alternative views, having read uh, Todd Lawson's book, uh, but this, I think, um, adds new, uh, to me, new evidence, new perspectives, additional Quranic verses as well, which I think help to shape the interpretive context of um, our engagement with that particular verse about the crucifixion. So I, I find that, as I say, compelling what you've done. Um, just a further question for you. Um, is, is, uh, have you written about this online or in any other works that people might follow up or access? Um, or I recently, about less than a year ago, published a book on the crucifixion called The Crucifixion of Jesus, right? Uh, in which I deal with this subject, obviously. And uh, that is different because I, the first part deals with um, the historicity question. Uh, and then uh, I deal also with theology and I deal also with the Quranic perspective. And I have recently uh, written a paper uh, on this particular uh, basically similar to the subject of this um, uh, discussion, uh, which is under consideration uh, with an academic journal. I see. So that's not published yet. So hopefully that will be... Uh, the published. paper not. No, the paper, exactly. But obviously the book is, which, which you mentioned, so that is available to, yes. to, to consult. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, once again, thank you so much uh, for your uh, valuable presentation. I, I think um, going forward, th this particular presentation uh, on this video will be a resource for students uh, and scholars to um, to access and to, um, you know, as a, as a help towards forming their own conclusions about what the verse actually says. So it, it's a, a valuable resource for the future. Thank you for that. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, we'll leave it there. And um, thank you. Until next time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you.